You can go ahead and turn with me um, over in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles with you this weekend, if you don't, then somewhere sitting around you, you have you should be able to find one. Um, some there's Bibles positioned all throughout the worship auditorium. Uh, take one out if you don't own one, don't have a Bible. Then this is our gift to you as a church. Um, and uh, please uh, just take this. And, uh, and if you have questions about anything, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. But turn me over to Matthew chapter seven. Matthew chapter 7, if you have a smart device, if you have a Bible app, then you can just um, open that up to Matthew chapter 7 is where we'll be this weekend. Again, let me say thanks for being with us. Those of you that are online, thanks for being with us as well. Um, I want to uh, just highlight some things that are going on um, and just uh, just some quick announcements real quickly. Uh, don't forget that the last Sunday of each month, we are the fourth Sunday of each month, we collect uh, diapers and uh, uh, baby food and wipes and all that for for just to help families in the community as well as even families within the church. And on the first Sunday of each month, which next Sunday, we actually collect canned food and, and non-perishable items. Uh, please keep that in mind, non-perishable items. Um, so uh, that we also that we collect the first um, weekend of each month. Uh, so that would be next weekend. I, I say all that to you because I, I got this text yesterday afternoon. I just want to read you and just let you know some of the things that are going. There's multiple things all throughout the week that go on uh, that God is using through His church, specifically with the church body here. But I wanted to give you a highlight on something that says, uh, this is why I received it. It says, today, uh, it says, just want to give some update on the care closet, which was open yesterday. It says, today we were able to provide canned foods to nine families. Diapers and wipes to seven children, and clothes and shoes to over 20 people. Amen. Um, so listen to the need. See the need, and and, and that's how the you know I, I I believe that the more we give, the more we have the opportunity to be able to help people all throughout our community. Um, it says, and then it goes on to say the text. It says, I, I have some of the, some of the people. These are some of the things they said they needed: uh, towels. Washcloths, blankets, and then scarves. And then, then this was at the close of the text I received. It said the people who come to the care closet yesterday also wanted and and voiced that they wanted everybody to know how much um, they just to those that volunteer and those that have donated, um, how much they just greatly appreciate us and what we are able to do and what we're doing for the community. Um, so I wanted to give you an update and just because a lot of times um, we don't hear those things. And since I got this text yesterday, I wanted to share that with you. But there's just a lot of things going on this afternoon. If you're new with us or if you uh, didn't realize it or maybe if you're like me sometimes, even within the week we forget about things. Um, maybe even this morning we've got uh, the immediately following worship we're going to do. Uh, just uh, get together and eat together. And uh, it doesn't matter if you brought food or not. Please just make plans if you're available uh, to stick around to spend some time together. But uh, we, as we look at this, two weeks ago, we looked at just one of the things we struggled with so much was this idea of worry and, and anxiety. And we talked about how with, mental, uh, with our mental health and all, there's, there's things that we, uh, down through the years and even within the church, we've struggled to, to voice or struggled to share or maybe misunderstood scripturally where to go with the idea of mental health. And so two weeks ago, we talked about the idea of looking at uh, over in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus actually addressed this idea of worry and not to worry, um, that a lot of times we, we are consumed with worry and we, have, we struggle with worry because we don't understand how much we're valued by God, how much God loves us, how much God wants to take care of us, how much God wants to provide for us. And then last weekend, yeah, we, we dove into that a little bit more. And, and we looked at the idea that was being portrayed for us, not only that we're valued, but then we looked at that promise that's given to us that if we are actually seeking His kingdom, remember this? If we're seeking His kingdom, we're seeking His righteousness, that there's actually a promise that's there in that part of Matthew chapter 6 that He will meet all our needs. Now, notice I didn't say that he would meet what we wanted. We talked about that last weekend. I mean, we talked about this real quickly. I like steak. Y'all know that. But he doesn't mean that he necessarily will 
provide me with a steak when I necessarily want that steak. It's not God. God is not our genie in a bottle. And we do you know we just say, "Hey, I want this. I want this. I want this." But no, if we're seeking His kingdom, if we're seeking His righteousness, then He will meet all our needs. But there's a disclaimer on this promise. You remember, no disclaimer. This promise does not apply for those that are not seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, we don't like to hear that part. But here's the amazing thing about God's love, and we see it all the time, is that God, even for those that aren't seeking his kingdom, even for those that aren't seeking his right, how often do we see actually the blessings that are flowed out of God that fall on others that are even, and God doesn't have to. That's not a promise. But for us that are seeking his kingdom, as we strive to seek his kingdom, not meaning that we're perfect, not meaning that we are that we're, we're, we're that God is asking for perfection, that yes, we're gonna mess up, yes, there are times when we sin and all these different things, but we are seeking after this relationship with him. We're seeking after righteousness, we're seeking after the kingdom. Then this promise applies to those that are doing that. That God will meet all our needs. This weekend, Matthew chapter 7, it seems like Jesus, he, boy, he does. He shifts gears a little bit here. And uh, he, he goes into something that, uh, specifically in our culture today, we see over and over again. And let me just kind of set this up for you. Several years ago, in fact, um, a little over 19 years ago, my family was introduced to a, y'all know I'm very, for those who know me, I'm, I'm a really big sports fanatic. I love sports. I, I love everything around. I love different sports and different things like that. And, and but, but one of the sports I was not introduced to that I actually, over 19 years ago, was introduced to was the idea of soccer. How many are you familiar with soccer? Okay. Now, we have grown as a family because of our three children playing it at, at, at very specific times in their lives. We would be called what you call the soccer family. And, and early on, I was that soccer dad. I mean, you, you see that, 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 that soccer dad? I was that soccer dad. Now, over the course of time, the soccer dad has chilled out. And I just kind of, now I have the soccer mom. And I have to look at the soccer mom and say, well, you've just taken on my personality, it looks like, from that. But early on, when we first, the very first practice that we ever took our oldest Meredith to, I never will forget. It kind of uh, shaped me with this idea uh, and I never would put myself in this category, but this kind of, this, uh, my mind automatically goes back to this. There was the very first, we knew nothing about soccer, and Meredith wanted to play. We knew nothing. And uh, uh, here's little Meredith, and she's going, and we didn't know how to put the shin guards on or nothing like that. We had the shin guards outside the socks and all these different things. We had them on backwards, and we, we just did not know what we were doing at all. And when we get there, we're meeting some of the families and meeting some of the kids that were going to be on our team. And, and looking around to see who the coach was going to be. Well, as we looked around, and, and there was this gentleman that had pulled up on this amazing, let me just, it was an amazing motorcycle. Gorgeous, custom made, this beautiful motorcycle. He got off that motorcycle, and he was there, and Next thing I know, he speaks up and says, okay, let's get together. And he's drawing all the young ladies in for practice. And my first idea was, there is no way this is going to be tragic. This, this gentleman, he, uh, uh, now, now, now stick with me on this, but this gentleman just, he got, he was the one that got off this amazing motorcycle. He had long, flowing black hair. Long beard, which you all see me sometimes with beard, so, but he had long beard. He, he had tattoos all up and down his arms. He had bike boots, biker boots on. He was just, I thought, there is no way this guy, this is going to be the longest year. There's no way. He must, he must have been the one dad that was willing to volunteer to coach the team. I was totally wrong. Out of all the coaches, and we've had a lot of coaches in 19 years of soccer, out of all the coaches, I would have to say, he was the first, was the best coach that my kids ever had. And that was the first coach that Meredith, and when he started our soccer 19-year career, that was, he was the 
best coach out of all of them. And here's the thing. I immediate, immediately judged him on one. Looks. Looks, his appearance. First I judged him, then I judged him on his appearance. Which was totally contrary to who this guy was. The more I got to know him down through the season, he was an amazing family man. Loved his wife dearly. Committed to her. Uh, lavished her. Loved her. His children was an amazing dad. He actually had a, he graduated from the University of Missouri. Had his degree in accounting. Had worked at one of the top accounting firms in downtown St. Louis. But he loved motorcycles, and he loved building motorcycles, and he'd always wanted to open up his own motorcycle shop. So he made that step. He stepped out, and he opened up his own business. And he shared with me, he said, the reason why that I have all these tattoos is one reason. He said, it is to remind me that when I stepped out, and when I walked out of my accountant office for the very last time, that I had no choice but to succeed. Because no one else was ever going to hire me. So I had to make it. I was totally wrong about this guy. Totally missed it. We live in a culture society today that I, if I was just to ask, have you, and you don't have to answer out loud, maybe if you want to, you write in your notes, please, and let me encourage you to take notes. Oh, uh, if I, uh, have, have you judged anybody this week for anything? Or look, uh, not necessarily look, just judge them this week. If so, maybe write down in your notes. But, but perhaps what we're about to talk about and what Jesus dives into, and I want to encourage you to stay with us this weekend and follow through with God's word as we look at this. Perhaps the most well-known, probably in our culture today, the most quoted, specifically with young adults, and the most also taken out of context, and you can write that in your notes, probably the most well-known, probably the most taken out of context scripture is what we see at the very beginning of the section that we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 7, looking at verses 1 through 6. And verse 1, and this is probably, again, the most quoted, most taken out of context scriptures, it says, do not judge others, and you will not be judged. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. <laughs> See, when a judgment is made against another, if a person knows just a little bit of Scripture, just enough of Scripture to make them dangerous, you know anybody like that? They know just enough. If a person knows just enough of the Bible, often this is the verse, when this comes up, they will refer it to. Because the if something like this is going on in the idea of judgment, they'll say, well, the Bible says not to judge me. Don't judge me. How dare you question me? How dare you question? Are you telling me that I'm wrong? How dare you say that? But is this what Jesus is saying? People say, well, we, we shouldn't judge. We, 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 we don't have the right to judge. So don't judge me. Did Jesus mean that we all should have, or we all should leave each other alone and not make any judgment regarding others? Is that what Jesus is referring to here when he says this? Well, they're not going to be on the screens, and I, I just want you, if you will, to maybe just put your pen down for a minute. If you're taking notes, your pencil, or maybe you can write these references. You're not going to see them on the screens, and I'm not going to have you turn to them. I just want you to listen to these words for a minute. Listen to some of these teachings in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 says, The spiritual person judges all things. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 through 13 says, For what I have, what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. 1 John 4, 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Or Matthew chapter 7, we'll eventually get to this passage, this, this, this section, but Matthew chapter 7 on down, if you look on down, verse 15 16 says, Beware of false prophets. 
who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will, you will recognize them by their fruits. Now just those few scriptures, I could have kept going, but just in those few scriptures are clear that we are making judgments. In fact, in this very text, Jesus is actually, we don't maybe don't understand or see this, but Jesus is actually commanding judgment because we are determined, determining if our brothers or sisters in Christ, as we look on, if they have a speck in their eye. So this must not be saying, or as we look, it's not saying that there are can never be a judgment made. We must determine then, so if that's not what Jesus is saying, then, then what is he saying? What do we do with this? If we want to be obedient to this, if we want to apply this to our lives, then what does that look like to the early audience and to us leaning in as being part of the audience? Is Jesus speaking? What is he saying? What does that look like? So look at verse 2 through 4 of chapter 7. It says this, For you will be treated as you treated others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Now underline that, or highlight that, or put a circle around that, whatever that is for you. It, says, it goes on to say, And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have the law in your own? Now, but, uh, some of you may not know what this reference is. I hope most of you do. But outside this part right here where it says, uh, especially in your friend's eye, when you have your log lo in your own, write LOL there. <laughs> Just write LOL. And it goes on to say, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye? When you can't see past the log in your own eye. And then you can write LOL outside that too. And we'll get to that in just a minute. See, what Jesus is dealing with, and this idea of this judging and not judging all that, is, is with the judging you will pr pronounce, when you pronounce judgment on something. Jesus is saying, okay, you better be careful about this. He's acknowledging that, well, wait a minute, we're going to, in other words, the measuring aspect is that what, what you're judging on, it could be that you're be judged on that. And we'll dive into this a little bit more as we track along on what Jesus is talking about. See, this is what Jesus is saying. This is what he shows. That Jesus is not speaking about right, godly judgment here. When he's talking about this idea of not judging. Jesus is actually speaking about human judgment, unrighteous judgment, and unreasonable judgment. We've talked about this before in different texts that we've looked at, is the fact that God is the one that's righteous. We are not. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ, it is through Jesus rising from the dead, that we are made right before God through Jesus, not by ourselves. But Jesus is righteous. See, this command should make us want to be, in other words, fair with others. Because when you look at this, when I know that God is looking at me, and when I stand before God, and all of this that takes place, I know that I want God, I want God's mercy. Anybody here not want God's mercy? <laughs> I want to experience grace. I want God to be fair. I want him to be just. Then Jesus is saying, okay, then judge others fairly and mercifully. Verse 3 and 4 here helps us to understand, though, the problem Jesus is actually dealing with. See, Jesus pictures a person who is able to see everyone else as faults. But in other words, is unable to see their own. Jesus is looking at this fact because here's the thing. So often, this sounds good to us. 
We, 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 we master in this idea of looking at others, whatever it is, inside the church, outside the church, we master in this degree of looking at others and saying, well, I'm not as bad as they are. Yeah, I might be bad, but I'm not as bad as they are. They've done this, 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 and this. Uh, maybe you haven't said it out loud, but maybe you thought in your mind, and please don't raise your hand up, but maybe you thought, well, I can't believe they, I can't believe they showed up, or I can't believe they're part of worship, or all these different things we think or we say, maybe not out loud, but to ourselves. How easy it is, because it's one of these things that we've talked about over the past few years. A lot of things we look at and we do, this isn't what Jesus is actually talking about or referring to. You know, this whole idea of wrapping our minds around spirituality is that it makes us feel good. It sounds right because it makes us feel good. And because it sounds right, it makes us feel right. And therefore, it must be right. And this must be what God meant. When it wasn't what God meant at all. How easy it is for us to judge other people. But have no desire. No desire. To judge ourselves. By the same measures. No desire at all. Have you ever. Don't say this out loud. And don't raise your hand. But have you ever. Have you ever helped someone to a statement that you didn't hold yourself? And, and, and then when someone actually did question you on it, you say, well, this is why I'm allowed to do it. Again, don't raise your hand. Don't answer out loud. Now, some of you probably have heard this before, but one of the things we miss so often is the fact that just how humorous and how funny and just how um, relational Jesus was. And how much we miss that specific, specifically. And even in looking at this text, you see, when we when we see this idea, this when, it, when Jesus says, talk about the speck, literally a splinter of wood in the eye of another person. In other words, when Jesus is saying you're, you're able to look so closely at others and examine their lives, and you're able just to dissect them to the finest little detail, and, and that you see the splinter of wood in their, that person's eyes, but the fact of the matter is, and, and here's even more of the humor, but Jesus is saying that you literally have a log in your eye, but you won't acknowledge it. You don't see it. You literally have a beam of wood used for construction. Uh, maybe you can put a bar over a door in your own eye, but you're so concerned about the speck and this big beam, and you just, uh, just envision this, maybe write it down your notes, this big beam and this eye, big beam coming out of it, and you can't see that big beam because you're so concerned about the speck. I can just imagine audience chuckling ah. maybe some maybe nudge and say well that's you <laughs> some reason I even think that probably wasn't going on you see the splinter in another person but we don't see the beam coming out of our own eye now here's the thing how is it possible for a person to not see this glaring huge beam of wood coming out of their own eye The reason why is that we fail to actually pay attention to ourselves. Because if we actually pay attention to ourselves, if we actually are looking at ourselves, if we actually realize how unworthy we are to be in the presence of God, if we actually realize and actually allow ourselves to understand that we need a Savior, we need Jesus, then it changes the whole game. Therefore, we like to look at others and judge others and put them on because it makes us, again, feel good. Now, 
We are so interested in looking at the problems and issues of others and how messed up they are that we don't see the failures or the sin in our own lives and are not willing to deal with them. This is the very nature, and you write this down in your notes, please. This is the very nature of self-righteousness. Let me say that again. This is the very nature of self-righteousness. We condemn others, but we justify, or we find a way to justify ourselves for the same actions. Now, don't again, don't answer out loud, but we have to ask the question, and we have to deal with this. Have you ever done this? Have I ever done this? <laughs> we pass judgment on another person. For something that they are doing, but when it comes to you, hey, hey, you don't you don't hold yourself to the same standard. And in your mind, you have a good reason why you don't. We have an excuse as to why it is okay for you and not for others. We apply to others what we are unwilling to apply to ourselves. You judge others, we judge others without compassion, without love, without tenderness. And again, it feels good. We, we like this. We, it makes us feel like, well, it is our responsibility to God to, to be the guards of God. It's our responsibility to point out the wrongs of others. Because it feels good. It puts us on a higher place, if you will. Instead of realization, which we'll get to this in a minute, that when it comes time to, for accountability, when it comes to this, is what we're dealing with is part of discipleship. Jesus is not saying not to hold people to and, and not to, uh, uh, no, he's not speaking against truth, there's actual truth. But realization is that when we understand and we look at our own lives and our sin and we work on with our own lives, then we look at others differently. We look at, through, look at it through the lens of compassion and love and tenderness and care and with mercy and with grace. James, actually, in James chapter 1, verse 22 and 24, he actually gave a warning for not seeing ourselves for who we really are. Listen to these words. He says, but be doers of the word. Underline that, sort of that. Let's just say, be doers of the word. And let's just think about it. Well, that sounds good. I like that. Be, be doers, be doers. What, is, what, what does that seem to be implying? It's an, an action. Be what you're actually reading, what you're actually allowing it to come in. It's actually flowing. In other words, moving it from knowledge actually to wisdom, you're applying it. But be doers of the word and not hearers only. So often we hear. Let me ask you, don't say a lot. Not this. Now, don't look to the person. Don't, don't judge. <laughs> but think about, for some of you, how many messages, how many Bible studies have you heard down through the years? And then, just think this through. Have you been hearers? Or have you been doers? Have you been hearers? Or have you been doers? It says, but be doers of the word and not just hearers only, deceiving. A circle that. I'm not listening to that. That's that's a pretty painful word there. But, but be de only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, listen to these words. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a what? Doer. Not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he's like. 
Let that sink in a minute. Now, if you look over here, and those that are watching online, I have a mirror over here. Now, I didn't want to turn up mirrors, so y'all had to look at this all the time. And it's kind of interesting as you're preaching to kind of just glance and have it there as well. But I have this mirror, and it's kind of like that we go and met most of us, now some of you maybe not, but most of us, we look sometime in the mirror this morning before we <laughs> walk into worship, do we not? Some of you maybe not. <laughs> we did. And it's like when we look at this mirror, and then we walk away, and we're looking at it, and, but then we walk away, and we forget. Oh, my, and I, like I go up to Susan, I walk in this mirror, if, you, if I look in this mirror, this mirror is going to show me that I have nothing up here. But I go over to Susan, and say, Susan, what do you think, doesn't my hair look beautiful today? <laughs> <clears throat> we look in a mirror and we see ourselves for who we are. Or should I say, we don't look in a mirror and see ourselves for who we are and for what we've done. We walk around with a mirror so often. We walk around, and if I put, put this mirror up, walk around, and so often that's what we do. We walk around. Have you seen yourself lately? You don't look very good. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you don't look the way. You're not, you're, not, you're not portraying what you think you are portraying. You need to look in the mirror. What you're saying is not what we're seeing. So a lot of times we walk around with the mirror turned toward people <coughs> instead of walking around with the mirror turned toward us. And before we speak, we look in the mirror. And when we look in the mirror and we see ourselves, it will control so often what we say. Or when we do say, it will control how we actually say it. Verse 5 says this. It says hypocrites. Circle that. Highlight that. And you're like, well, that makes you feel good, doesn't it? <laughs> Anybody ever been called a hypocrite? Don't ever raise your hand. Are you a hypocrite? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. See, this is, and all this is part of discipleship. Jesus is not saying that, hey, not to actually engage with people. Not to say, hey, wait a minute, let's sit down, let's walk this through scripturally, what we're seeing here, no, no, and walk this through life. That's not what Jesus is saying. That's not what he's saying to the early eyes. That's not what he's saying to us as we listen to as Jesus speaks. He's not saying that at all. He's saying the fact that when you see well enough to deal with what's going on in your own life, It's in other words, write this in your notes, please. It is we talk about this so much. It is a heart issue. Jesus is saying, check your heart. Why is this so important to you? Why are you addressing this individual or individuals? Why are you bringing this out? Is this something really? In other words, let me just say, we'll dive into this a little bit more. Before you, before you ever engage with someone. Have you immersed your conversations in prayer? Let me say that again. We'll dive in this more next week. Before you ever engage, this is why I believe that one of the, before my feet ever hit the ground when I wake up in the morning, that I am saying a prayer. Because, and do we always get this right? Of course not. Jesus knows that. That's not what he's saying. But the fact that, hey, when we're in various conversations with individuals, co-workers, family, people that we don't know, people we do know, have we actually immersed what we're going to say in prayer? When we are going to engage with someone and address something that's scripturally that needs to be brought, have we immersed that individual in prayer? Have we actually covered it? in that passage of scripture or whatever that sin that we're that we need to address have we covered that in prayer or are we just speaking you ever just 
said something and didn't really think about it first? Ever just shot an email out or shot a text, get a response to that and as soon as it's gone, you can't bring it back, you go, oh. Put something on Facebook. You go, well, I should have thought that through. Ever said something and knowing that, hey, you didn't even immerse it in prayer, didn't, you know, that it, it, was, it was genuine. You were trying to do it out of love, but the, actually there was just the spirit was wrong or the timing was wrong. And even, maybe it was done years ago, but even to this day, there's still ramifications from that. See, Jesus, and none of us look at this, but did you all realize that Jesus called us to be Christians? Mm -hmm. Jesus calls us hypocrites. When we engage in this type of behavior that he's addressing, when we judge others in a way that we would not judge ourselves, we are hypocrites. When we hold others to a different standard than we hold ourselves, Jesus is saying we're hypocrites. So what do we do with this? Let's move on. Let's speed this up a little bit. What do we do with all this? What does this look like? Right solution. If you will in your notes, please. It's real easy. Look at yourself before you look at others. Think about your own sin before you think of sin of the other. Of, before you think of the of sin of others. Think about your own. Think about your own failures before you feel the desire to confront, or before you confront another about their, their shortcomings, their sins, their failures. First, judge our own life by the same standard, by the same way as you judge others. And what happens is when we start to do this, this, this kind of slows the process down. We're not so fast about our judgments. This, this keeps us from making so often fault. It doesn't mean that we're per perfect at it, no, but it does keep us from so often making false judgments on others. Verse 6, look at this. It, it kind of gives us this idea. It kind of sets the stage for us how to really dive into this idea of judgment. Listen to these words. It kind of, it kind of just seems like that. It, it, at first glance, it seems like well, maybe we should have took next weekend and just talked about this verse. It seems like it doesn't fit in place. But it actually, when you look at it, it's, and I say, it's very natural. Jesus is never saying that we shouldn't judge or make evaluations about others. Jesus is wanting us to see that we need to make the godly evaluations. We need to ask for God's wisdom, His discernment. We need to, that we're through his, his love as we look and evaluate and as we judge. Verse 6 sets the stage for us here. He says this, don't waste. Don't waste what is holy on people who are what? Unholy. Unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls. Then turn and what? Attack, Attack you. <laughs> in other words, we are warned not to waste our time on those who have no interest. Can you write this down in your notes, please? Who have no interest in the gospel or in Jesus. <coughs> Now, pigs were counted as, they were considered unclean as we look at, in, at, at the law. And dogs were wild, and they were considered just wild and nasty, and they were, they were, uh, they were rough. And in this illustration, pigs and dogs uh, wanted to say, talking about they wanted the scraps of the food. In other words, they don't want the best. They're trying to go along picking up the scraps. 
And Jesus is saying we are called to identify who are the dogs and who are the pigs. Now, write this in your notes because this is really important. Which could be a misunderstood. Jesus is not using a characterization here. But this idea, this, this, this illustration of dogs and pigs. Uh, not using a char characterization about a person, but an understanding of how we should treat or how they actually treat the gospel. In other words, this is actually describing somebody's spiritual condition. Here again, we're seeing it again, a reminder to meet people where they're at. To meet them where they're at. If someone's antagonistic to the gospel and, and, and not wanting to respond or doesn't respond, Proverbs 23, 9 says this, Do not speak in hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. Paul, actually, the Apostle Paul actually deals with this in Acts chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. Look at these verses. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews... Listen to this. When the Jews saw the crowd, they were filled with what? Jealousy. They were filled with jealousy. In other words, everybody was coming together to hear what was to be said. And the Jews, when they saw actually what Paul and Barnabas were talking about, when they saw the crowds gathering, they became jealous of them. They were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was being spoken by Paul, reviling him, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, listen to this, says, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. In other words, we're here speaking to you, because this is what God's desire was. God wants you to hear. You need to hear this. You need to see this. God wanted us to come. But since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. Because you are unwilling to hear the gospel. Because you are unwilling. Because jealousy is right. Because of pride. Because of arrogance. Because of this. Because we're going to take, we're going to turn away from you. And we're going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. At some point, we have to make a determination of when our efforts <clears throat> in righteousness are not fruitful. Listen, there is a point where we have to say that all we've done, we've done all that we can do. There is no use in continuing to bring about repentance. Now, don't miss what Jesus is saying. Jesus is not saying to immerse, to continue to immerse them in prayer. He's not saying that we should continue to engage in the relationship. He is saying, though, that sometimes our, our efforts may be in vain. You have said what needs to be said. You've done, you've been obedient. You have done what needs to be done. He says, do not cast the pearls of the gospel to those who will not have nothing, none of it. They are casting off that which is holy as foolishness and garbage. So, in closing, so how do we land this? What does this look like for us this weekend? Well, turn with me real quickly to John chapter 7. Or, or on, on your Bible app, go to John chapter 7. I want to just land this for us. John chapter 7, uh, Jesus has gone out. Jesus says, you know, his, his time's not, they're not, he's not quite there yet. And all this is going on. Jesus had, leading up to this, Jesus has performed, Jesus has done different things, and the disciples have done different things, and the people are looking at Jesus. The religious leaders are trying to catch Jesus, and, and we see at this very time in John chapter 7 that Jesus has performed evidently this miracle uh, of healing on the Sabbath. 
And it says there, if you read there on in John chapter 7, specifically in verse 10 through verse 23, you will see there that it's talking about, Jesus actually addresses this with the audience. They, they are amazed at Jesus, uh, uh, this miracle, but they're not amazed, don't misinterpret this, they're not amazed that Jesus actually performed the miracle. They're amazed that Jesus actually did a miracle on the Sabbath. They're not excited that a miracle took place. Wow, a miracle. They're actually excited that actually, they're, they're upset, they're amazed that actually Jesus would do this on the Sabbath, the holy day. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. And Jesus actually addresses this in verse 21. It's not on the screen, but I just want to kind of read it for us. Verse 21, Jesus replied, I did one miracle on the Sabbath, and you were amazed. Talking about that they were amazed that he did it on the Sabbath. But you work on the Sabbath too when you obey Moses' law of circumcision. Actually, this tradition of circumcision began with the patriarchs long before the law of Moses. Verse 23 says, For if the correct time for circumcising your son falls on the Sabbath, you go ahead and do it so as to not break the law of Moses. So, so why should you be angry with me for healing a man on the Sabbath? Verse 24 is what I want you to hold on to. Verse 24 says this. Look beneath the surface so you what? So you can judge correctly. Look beneath the surface. Look into your own heart. Look into your own being of who you are. For when we do this, we can judge correctly. We can judge as a follower of Christ through the eyes of Jesus, with the heart of Jesus, with the feet and hands of Jesus, because we realize that the only way we're made righteous before God is through Jesus. Amen. And because of that, we approach whatever it might be with love, with tenderness, with compassion, and with care.